My baby dolls, how have you been? We're back again with another episode of Genesis. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz, and I hope you all are doing extremely well. we got a great show coming up for you today. we got a great, great thing on women's baseball. And no, it's not the league of their own of the 1940s, but would you believe baseball in the 1800s? And would you believe if I would have told you that women have been a big part of baseball since its inception way back in the 1830s? And we got Professor Deborah A. Shattuck on the line, in which we'll get to her in a few minutes. And this is going to be a very, very worthwhile learning experience with her just published book back in January, The Bloomer Girls, Women Baseball Pioneers. But even before we get to the book and to Deborah, you are listening to the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. The producer, of course, is the Zigzag Man, Ralph Tycho, which I do a show with him on New York and San Francisco Giants baseball. And again, he puts the Z in there for Zig, Zag Man. And of course, you can also find me on David Nemec's Old Time Baseball and Trivia with Dave Nemec himself and Alan Blumkin, and we have a lot of fun with that. We are taping this show. Today is the 18th of May. It is very, very hot in the Northeast. Now, this is very odd, you know, because, again, it affects baseball. You know, the other night, I'm up here in Red Sox territory, and I wake up, it's 34 degrees freezing, gets up to 50. Today, it's going to be 93, so now you're switching gears. There's no spring. There's no in-between. It's just, I don't know what Mother Nature's uh, doing, but already it looks like it's going to be, what they say up here, a wicked hot summer. And um, I don't like that. I like to go onto the uh, ball field where my sons are playing, like tonight, and it's a nice 65, 70 degrees. But, hey, you can't have it all every way you want. But anyway, getting to this book, and I want to read you what the... Um, the flyer says, and uh, what you'll find on the Internet um, about what this book is about. And um, this is a little uh, synopsis of uh, the Bloomer Girls, Women Baseball Pioneers. Disapproving scolds, sexist condescension, odd theories about the effect of exercise on reproductive organs. Though baseball begins as a gender-neutral sport, like I mentioned on the top of my show, women were a, starter, were a part of the starter baseball. Girls and women of the 19th century faced many obstacles on their way to the diamond. Yet all female nines took the field everywhere. Professor Deborah A. Shattuck pulls from newspaper accounts and hard-to-find club archives to reconstruct a forgotten era in baseball. And let me tell you something, folks. This stuff isn't very readily uh, mentioned unless you go to places like Sabre and other, uh, you know, places on the Internet, which you can uh, pretty much read and uh, educate yourself on this. Her fascinating social history tracks women players who organized baseball clubs for their own enjoyment and found roster spots on men's teams. Entrepreneurs, meanwhile, packaged women's teams as entertainment. And we'll find out about the vaudevillian effect and all this um, that women, um, you know, went through in the 1870s, like like any other uh, early baseball, a lot of carnies, a lot of, like, you know, show. It was considered not a sport, but, you know, an act uh, to entertain people. Organizing leads and barnstorming tours, which ended up being a very big part of the women, um, you know, experience in baseball. If the women faced financial exploitations and indignities like playing against men in women's clothing, they and countless ball players like them nonetheless staked a claim to the nascent, or as nascent, who knows, uh, my my use of the English language, I sometimes butcher national pastime. Professor Shadok explores how the determination to take their turn at bat thrust female players into narratives of the women's rights movement and transform perceptions of women's physical and mental capacity. And, of course, Professor Deborah Shadok is provost and the assistant professor of history at John Witherspoon College. I must also add, she was a colonel in the Air Force as well. She's no slouch. And welcome to the show, Professor Shadok. 
Hello, Ian. How are you doing? It's a nice, balmy 38 degrees out here in Rapid City, South Dakota. <laughs> hey, I'd rather have that than the 70 <laughs> degrees that I... So you're central time, huh? Um, actually, mountain time. Oh, my God. I didn't realize that. So it's 8 o'clock by What time's class? Yeah, I had to wake up pretty early this morning for this. Uh, now, do you, how many kids do you have? Do you have any kids? I do. I have uh, three grown children, one in Ohio, one in Washington State, and one here in Yankton, South Dakota. Well, that's good. At least you don't have them nagging you at that uh, 4.30 like mine do. Mine, uh, I had twins. <laughs> well, I do, be, have uh, my first, I do have my first grandbaby due in about six weeks, so I'm very excited and happy to lose sleep over that. Oh, congratulations, uh, the grandbaby. And you're not even... You're not even, well, how old are you, 54, I would say? Yeah, a little bit higher. Oh, I didn't know that. But um, anyway, with the book, I loved your opening because you quoted Winston Churchill on writing a book. And I have all of Churchill's writings uh, about the Second World War, about the First World War. And um, I kind of laughed, you know, when you quoted him saying, writing a book is an adventure to begin with. It's a toy and amusement, which it is when you think of it. Then it becomes a mistress and then a tyrant. The late phase is that, just as you were about to be reconciled to your servitor, dude, you kill the monster and fling him out to the public. How long did it take you to research this book? Because I saw articles about this way before this was even published. And uh, did you have to throw it out to the public? Well, it's probably about 30 years in total, but not steadily. I uh, started back in 1987 when the Air Force had sent me to Brown to get my master's degree. And so my master's thesis was on women baseball players. Then I continued to work on the research while I was teaching history at the Air Force Academy from 87 to 91. At that point, I knew I wanted to write a book, but unfortunately, at that point, I had three very young children plus my Air Force career, and I had to put it on hold until I retired in 2008. As soon as I retired, I dove back in full-time, got to work on my Ph.D. at University of Iowa, and the book uh, was my dissertation. So probably all told about seven solid years of research on it and writing. And you know something, when you look at the uh, notes, and I don't know if anyone looks at the notes, I learned just as much through the notes, because I actually read it, <laughs> than you do of your whole treatise. And um, I, that's very important to um, to go further into this wonderful study of early uh, baseball, because you do end the book around the turn of the century, around 1900. Um, you know, it's pretty much an 1800 thing. How did women get into baseball right from the inception? Well, they got into baseball the same way they got into any activity. Uh, young girls would play with uh, the young boys in the neighborhood, whatever they were doing, the girls were doing. And so we find quite a few accounts of schoolyard teams of girls and boys playing baseball. Um, David Block, who wrote a wonderful book, Baseball Before We Knew It, identifies a, a British baseball game, which was played almost exclusively by girls, and that was in the 1700s and on into the 1800s. So it's, it's pretty much, as I discovered, uh, just like boys like baseball, so did young girls. And, you know, you make the distinction right away in the um – in the preface, uh, baseball versus softball, and of course this debate uh, continues to go on. Women should, women and girls should not play baseball, they should play softball. And I learned a lot by reading just a few pages on softball. Why is this that, um, you know, baseball's manly, softball's not? Exactly, and it's one of the most intriguing questions that I ended up tackling as I was doing this research. Uh, as you read from the preface, I had my own experiences growing up where I just naturally gravitated to baseball initially because that's what the neighborhood boys were playing, and so I played too. But then as I went on and thought, well, why don't I do some umpiring for 
boys baseball and uh, lasted one game because of the hatred that was expressed towards me for being a girl who dared to think that she could umpire. And I wasn't even the home plate umpire. I was out in the field. So that, uh, that was a real-life introduction to that mantra, baseball is for boys and softball is for girls. And I set out to try to answer that question of what happened. Why did baseball get so fiercely gendered as a man's game? And this other game, which wasn't even invented until the 20th century, why does that become the surrogate that women are supposed to play? And you know something? You answer that question in the book, of course. But, you know, along the way, like in uh, 1859, up in uh, Portland, Maine, which is near me. And by the way, I live about 15 minutes from Brown University. I'm in North Attleboro, uh, Massachusetts. So you've been up in my uh, in my area up here. Um, but uh, you wrote here, um, in 1859, the Portland Transcript described a local men's ball club enjoying the sport with great gusto. After wishing that more young men would choose this manly game over the saloons, billiard rooms, and club rooms they frequented. And the editor of the newspaper agreed. So you already have talk about this being a more better lifestyle than drinking in some saloon but playing baseball on the field, which would not be um, including women. Exactly. Now let me ask you this question. As the Civil War comes up, and then of course it ends, baseball is becoming the national pastime. Where do women uh, and again, we're talking about colleges, we're talking about pickup games, we're talking about 20 years before under Alexander Cartwright and, of course, uh, Dr. Um, you know, Adams, um, you know, Doc Adams, uh, baseball, mm-hmm. was, baseball was evolving slowly into the national pastime. But at first, it was given to patients for exercise. Where did women fit into this? Well, I did manage to run across a an entry, I believe it was 1859, I'm, I'm not positive on the date, from a one of these health spas that were very popular in the country at the time. People would go for what was called the rest cure. Doesn't that sound wonderful in our stressful life today? You just go to this place and do nothing but rest. That's, that's how we would get cured. But It did mention in this article that both the men and the women played baseball each evening at this, and this is a a spa or a resort for adults. So even in the 1850s and 1860s uh, prior to the Civil War, we did have um, a few or small examples of adult women playing baseball. And this distinction between girls and adults is very important when you're talking about women because girls could pretty much get away with anything in terms of activities. But when you reached a certain age, uh, basically when you hit puberty as as a girl, you were expected then to begin modeling what a quote unquote, as scholars use the term, true woman was. And that means you were quiet, you were docile, you didn't run around getting all sweaty, you learned how to cook and clean and and take care of a household. So I was particularly entranced as I ran across accounts of young women organizing and playing baseball teams because this was certainly outside of the norm. And you know, you do have, and I and I love the the uh, cartoons that you put into the book. Um, the last sporting sensation, a female baseball club at Peterborough, New York, August 29th, 1868. The last illustration of women's rights, a female baseball club at Peterborough, in October 3rd, 1868. Now, in your research, besides just what's written in the book. How much did you find from local newspapers? Because, again, vast research and stuff indicating, hey, they're all baseball and women are playing it. I found a tremendous amount. And, in fact, I actually, this book was going to cover 
the early 1800s, about starting about the 1830s, up through 1954 when the All-American Girls League folded. That was the original scope of the book. But once I got back into the research uh, in 2008, I discovered the wonderful world of digitized newspapers and archives. And by the time I was done looking and doing keyword searches on female base, women's base, etc., I ended up with over 1,200 single-spaced pages where I typed out thousands of newspaper and magazine articles just about 19th century women players. And that's why, quite frankly, the notes in this book are so extensive because this book is the first of its kind, but I absolutely hope that it is not the last of its kind. I want other scholars to pick up where I've left off, and that's that's the reason I put those appendices in there as well where I list Um, an example from every state in chronological order and by city, decade by decade. So somebody in a particular community can say, hey, they had a baseball team here in Niles, Michigan in 1867. I want to learn more about that. And then they can get some of the local papers that haven't been digitized yet and continue to expand on this important narrative that's been hidden for so long. And, you know, um, I mean, a lot of New York, Connecticut, uh, a lot of Massachusetts, like Haverhill, which I live near, and uh, Natick, and, uh, of course, Boston. And, uh, hey, did you, there's even out in Colorado, uh, when you look at a Staten Island, all the places you would think never would harbor this. But this is even before mm-hmm. the 1880s, where I know in the chapter – it's becoming more of a manly man, and women are starting to disappear. And stuff. But we're only in the 1860s. And in the 1870s, along comes the notion and this whole thing that's still written about today, the blondes and brunettes, and what's mm-hmm. that all about? Well, as far as we know, the very first team where women were p- paid to play baseball was the Springfield Blondes and Brunettes of Springfield, Illinois, and that was actually the very first uh, 19th century team I had heard about when I went to Cooperstown in 1987 to do research at the archives at the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, There was just one little folder that had some random clippings in it about women players, and one of those clippings mentioned the 1875 blondes and brunettes. And this was a team organized by a group of men, one of whom was the son of a man who founded what became a a very large retail operation there in Springfield. And uh, there was a gentleman from the local newspaper who was part of the group. Uh, Interestingly enough, there was a link to Abraham Lincoln in the group. Uh, One of the men was the brother of a lawyer that – Lincoln had invited to come to town at the time, so I found that kind of an interesting uh, connection there. But they organized this team. They had hoped to do a lengthy tour, barnstorming tour of the country. As it turned out, though, they only lasted for about six games by the time it was all said and done. They, They hit a lot of opposition. But the popularity spread to other parts, I've noticed, as you read into the book. Um, Besides Springfield, Illinois, you had other uh, cities uh, popping up, like the English Blondes and the American Brunettes in New York City. And then you had the Nine up in Boston, let me get the uh, proper terminology. The Lady Nine of Baltimore and Lady Nine of Boston. And that was a new well, idea. And interestingly <laughs> enough, as I discovered, a lot of these teams that had names of particular cities actually were not formed in those cities, nor did they have players from those cities. So, for example, the Lady Nine of Baltimore and Lady Nine of Boston, which were advertised to play at the Grand Female Baseball Festival in May of 1879 in New Orleans, or New Orleans, Uh, They actually were organized in New Orleans, and they played just the one game for this baseball festival. But none of the players, uh, as far as I can tell, were from Baltimore or Boston. Teams would 
pick names of cities that they that had men's teams or that they thought would attract attention, and that's how they picked some of their team names. And this continued, and now we're up to the 1880s, and now we're getting the sense, and your book does examine, now we're getting the sense that here the gender roles are starting to take place, and you've uncovered the evidence, um, you know, that, uh, hey, women have to start going away from baseball, and this is going to have um, the notion that this is a man's game. And I think the 1880s brought it out. Why don't you summarize what you found? Absolutely. You really begin to see the uh, press uh, just excoriating female baseball players. And part of this is because we, we're seeing the emergence of a sporting press whose fortunes are linked to the fortunes of this emerging professionalized pastime. Uh, many of your listeners may know that the National League, which is still in existence today, was organized in 1876. And so now there's a concerted effort by both the men that are associated with the professional teams of the National League, but also another group who make baseballs and bats and who sell newspapers based on people's rabid interest in the professional baseball teams. So anyone who can profit from the professionalization of baseball, they become the boosters of this new game. And in order to sell the new game, you need to demonstrate that it has value to society. And so one of the narratives that emerges is this idea that this sport can create uh, loyal American citizens, that it can promote American civilization, and ultimately that it can create manly men and leaders fathers, businessmen, just by playing this sport as a young man or a grown man, you can have all these wonderful things happen to the country. So you have to start pushing out the people that you don't want in the game. And so we read things in the newspaper, things like the female sex cannot play ball. The female intellect has difficulty in grasping the national pastime. Or calling another common complaint was that uh, that women's baseball is a fraud. You see that again and again. A bigger fraud probably never had an existence, one writer in 1883 says, after watching a women's game. So it, uh, it becomes pretty obvious when this transition takes place from women being allowed to play baseball because it's helpful to, once the game becomes professionalized, pushing women out. Because if women can play then it can't be a game that imbues masculinity. And this also um, went over to the race lines because, um, as your book points out, uh, you know, in 1883, uh, you had the Dolly Varden and uh, Captain Jinx of Chester, uh, Chester uh, Pennsylvania. The white journalists were overly racist during this period. Absolutely. The articles that you read about that particular uh, team or this troop, which unfortunately seems to have collapsed almost as soon as it was organized uh, by this white barber in Philadelphia who also had a Chinese nine on the on the road at the time. Uh, but if you read the articles, it's just appalling, uh, the, the descriptions of the players, not treated with any respect at all, but still a very, very important from a historical perspective that black women were also playing. And that's one of my greatest regrets in my research is I wasn't really able to find much about black women players during the 19th century. I found a few scattered references to it, uh, but I'm quite convinced that they did play and that as more of the black newspapers get digitized um, as we get into the archives of some of the um, all-black colleges. I believe we are going to find many more examples of black women playing baseball and black girls playing baseball in the 19th century. And you know something, again, 
this is before the gentleman's agreement in the late 1800s, 1880s, mm-hmm. excuse me, with Cap Anson, because now, you know, my feeling of this being a historian is this. This was all a backlash um, to the ramifications of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Do you think, in your um, opinion from your research, that women, just like minorities, um, were discriminated against, and this game was made to be white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, a uh, game that only men, those men should play. Well, absolutely, and, and that is part of that carefully crafted narrative that begins to emerge in the 1880s. And it's not only that the game makes boys into men and immigrants into Americans, but it's that Americanism as a whole becomes tied up with this game. So you see um, examples of trying to promote the game overseas, uh, taking teams sponsored in some cases by sporting goods companies and trying to promote the sport um, as an example of all-Americanism and this wonderful shining beacon on a hill, if you will. And, and in fact, uh, I was surprised to see that baseball was used by the North in in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, sending men to the South to teach Southerners how to play baseball. I found that absolutely fascinating, that they would try to use this sport to uh, reintegrate these Southerners back into the Union. And you know something, it, it's it's strange because you had the collegiate teams like Vassar College, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch upon Vassar College, we're stepping back maybe about 10 years. How important uh, was the women's baseball team at Vassar College to fuel a curiosity uh, amongst um, folks throughout the collegiate level in, at that time period? Well, I imagine that many young women got their first Uh, their first opportunity to play baseball at some of these women colleges. The first thing, though, that I want to make sure that your listeners understand, and it's something that I learned during the course of my research, that among at both men's and women's colleges, the any sporting teams were organized by the students themselves. You have to move up into the 1890s for the most part before you begin to see professional physical educators using sport to imbue good character into students. But prior to from the 1880s back, it's primarily students who are organizing these teams. The other key distinction that I want to make is that when you're talking about women collegians, I don't think I have found a single example of women's college teams prior to the 1880s playing against any other college. So these were always uh, games that were played on a single college campus, not advertised to the public, mostly just pickup games and for bragging rights between dormitories or uh, the class teams. So when you're talking collegiate baseball for girls and women, it's not intercollegiate the way we think of it today. And let me ask you this because, again, you know, the whole notion, and I know in your book you you wrote Performed Baseball, and this is where we get into a form of entertainment rather than, say, um, a sport like it is today. Yes, and that that was another thing that slowly dawned on me as I was doing my research. I began to understand that there are many different types of baseball teams. And uh, in in the history of men's baseball, after the 1876 professionalization under the National League and the slow growth in popularity of professional baseball – a lot of the histories of men's baseball tended to focus on that evolution of the game from an amateur pastime up through this big business, hugely popular national professional pastime, forgetting about all the other millions, literally millions of boys, girls, men, and women who are playing the game simply for fun. 
And so one of the aspects of baseball for women that I discovered were these early women's professional teams, such as the Springfield Blondes and Brunettes, where the team owners, always men, did not seek to hire supremely talented baseball players, but rather basically were putting together a troop of entertainers. So many of the early women's quote-unquote professional baseball players were from the theater, from the circus, and they were taught enough baseball to be able to make it look like a baseball game, but it was entertainment. It was sold as entertainment. And the fans who recognized that that's what they were going to get uh, usually thoroughly enjoyed the game. Those who went expecting to see a, a highly skilled baseball game were often disappointed and expressed that in their opinions about the games in the newspapers. But um, they would, the players would do things like um, when a ball was hit into the outfield, they would form a bucket brigade to relay the ball back into the infield. They would skip around the bases. They would dance around the bases. Uh, they would sing, you know, when the band would strike up a tune, they'd start dancing. So it, it was, that's where I coined this idea of, of, uh, players performing baseball and this idea of baseball burlesque al fresco. We, we see the emergence of female baseball nines in burlesque shows in the 1860s, as early as 1868. And then by 1875 now, we see men saying, well, let's take these baseball nines off the stage and put them outside. That'll be even more fun. And that's what they did. And you know something? It's, 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 um, it's really strange because at this time, you know, if, if people know their history, again, 1848, the Seneca Falls Conference, you know, the first big movement uh, that's going to shape um, the women's rights movement for the next oh, 70 years, uh, where you would read that women would go into saloons with axes and, and cut down alcohol and, and this whole thing that suffrage and women should vote. Now, originally, and I read this in an interview um, that you had, originally you had thought that um, most of the 19th century women's baseball teams had emerged out of the women's rights movement, but this wasn't the case. Exactly. When, when you, you mentioned that illustration from Peterborough where the caption yep. says the latest illust or the last illustration mm -hmm. of women's rights, a female baseball nine. So I just assumed that that had been the case. But it wasn't. And the reason that it wasn't is because baseball was not yet gendered as a man's game. It was not seen as this bastion of masculinity that had to be attacked. It was still relatively open to both male and female players. So, and, and even afterwards, uh, as we get up towards the late, uh, late 19th century, I really don't find examples where women as a whole are pushing back against this gendered narrative that is beginning to emerge. And I suspect, quite frankly, it's because they have better things to do. You know, they're trying to get more professions open to women. They're trying to get women access to the Ivy League colleges, to uh, better pay, to um, uh, other oh, voting. I mean, that's the big one. So as far as putting a concerted effort against this gendering of baseball, uh, the women's rights movement as a whole has, has other things to do. Now, certainly we're going to see in the 1970s and even the 1960s to some extent a concerted effort to break down these bans on girls playing Little League baseball, for example, or the American Legion baseball. But none of that, I saw none of that in the 19th century. Girls and women simply played baseball, and they didn't worry about what other people were thinking. And you know something? There's an article out here, and I don't know, um, I forget if your book um, uh, wrote about Women and Men Together by Dorothy Seymour Mills. And it was published on October 14, 2013, 
And in an 1879 game in Boston, a crowd of 1,600 watched a women's team from New York play another women's team from Philadelphia. Reporters thought they played poorly, and their appearance in public wearing short dresses shot many in the crowd. Nevertheless, they played against a month later in Cincinnati. So there was a following for women's baseball. Absolutely, but unlike the men's teams, you didn't have the same team playing again and again in the same place. So in 1879, for example, I did an analysis of the crowd sizes at the National League games and the games of this, uh, the Red Stockings and Blue Stockings, and was absolutely astonished to find that the, the women's teams actually drew more spectators on average in the National League cities than the men's teams did uh, on uh, seven, six of the seven teams where the, girl, the women had played in a National League city. But you got to remember the men's teams would play 40 home games and 40 away games. So they had 40 games to attract the fans of a particular city to follow them. But the women's teams, they barnstormed. So they weren't playing dozens of games in one location. They would do their practice games, like the Philadelphia team of 1883. They played about, I think, 12 or 15 practice games in Philadelphia where they actually, because people were peering in through the the knot holes in the fence, they started charging a dime for people to come in and watch the practice games. But after that, they were on the road. And so they had one chance as the train would stop in a particular town and their the advanced men would go out and plaster a place with posters. They had that one opportunity to attract fans. So they, they did fairly well. They would usually get hundreds and sometimes uh, a thousand or more spectators at this whistle stop where they would play a game and then move on to the next location. Now, I want you to describe to me, because now we're getting into the 1890s, and uh, across of, uh, paradoxical things are happening here. Number one, you know, women on one hand get out of baseball, and now they're doing other things like cycling and tennis and golf. But at the same time, this is when the Bloomer Girls, um, you know, formed, and there is a following um, you know, and, and, and baseball continues to be played uh, by not only collegiates and girls, but adults. What is this whole thing with the Gibson girl I- ideology that, that emerged during this period, and how did it impact the women's participation in baseball? Well, fortunately, medical science begins to catch up with reality by the late 1800s. Do, prior to that, you have this idea that was promoted in some best-selling books where it was believed that if young women engaged in vigorous physical activity after they begin menstruating, that it would literally sterilize them. They would be unable to have children. So this is a very scary thing for a young girl going off to college who's been reading these books uh, one man who happened to be a, a ordained minister actually said that higher education was uh, preparing women for the grave. So by using their mental faculties and playing games like baseball, that girls were actually risking their lives and their ability to bear children in the future. But by the 1880s, we begin to have the emergence of professionalized physical education where people are going to college now to learn how to teach physical education and they're beginning to try to convince young women to stop wearing corsets because it's imperiling their health and they're trying to convince young women you need to exercise you need to play baseball you need to play basketball you need to sweat it's good for you it's not going to kill you and so Slowly, society begins to catch on to this idea that vigorous physical activity is as good for grown women as it is for grown men, and you just see an explosion in women getting involved in sports like tennis, basketball, which was invented in the 1890s, and thanks to the invention of pneumatic bicycle tires, we have this 
huge number of women cycling, which now here's here's a sport that frees women. They can go out on these what they call century rides, a hundred mile rides. Uh, they're in groups of women. They're alone. They're no chaperones, no male chaperones. They're just enjoying this unprecedented freedom. And of course, you can't ride a bicycle in a really long skirt, although many women tried. And you begin to see more and more women adopting those voluminous uh, early pants for women called bloomers. And society begins to accept that. You see this Gibson girl was named for an artist who began to draw and illustrate these beautiful, rosy-cheeked, robust, athletic women. And society began to see the athletic woman as the new uh, the new symbol of womanhood. And so that opens all kinds of doors. And as you mentioned, this is when the Bloomer Girl baseball teams emerge. And these are professional teams where the idea really is to hire the very best athletes we can find. And they actually go around playing men's teams. So it's kind of the battle of the sexes, if you will, which in and of itself uh, can draw a lot of spectators. And, you know, even before I get to uh, Lizzie, which is great, I love I love her story. Um, hey, you got a New York State legislator named Edward McCormick. He tried to introduce a bill to prohibit women from playing baseball. Yes. Well, that was because of Sylvester Wilson, though, the guy who organized numerous uh, young women's baseball teams in the 1800s. Uh, beginning in 1879, but the man was a pedophile. Uh, he he just he preyed on these young girls, and so that was what this particular legislator was responding to. Is he wanted to protect girls from these lecherous men who were organizing these teams for profit? Unbelievable. You just never know, huh? I mean, it's almost like, what do you, what do you call it? Because again, this took place in Kings County. I was brought mm-hmm. up in Kings County. That's called Brooklyn. <laughs> my family, my family still lives there. Kings County, Queens County, um, Nassau, and Suffolk. Let me ask you this: How important uh, was Lizzie Arlington to this whole era? And um, did, did, and if you do the research, besides your book, there's a lot of information on her on the net. Absolutely. Um, she is, she does personify, her and Maude Nelson both personify this new approval of highly skilled and talented female athletes. Both Nelson and Arlington were superb pitchers, um, easily able to take on male players, and were given some opportunities to do so. In particular, Lizzie Arlington signed to play on – uh, the men's minor leagues during the Spanish-American War when the gate receipts were beginning to fall. So uh, she was given an opportunity. The idea was to have her pitch for each of the men's minor league teams in this particular minor league. As it turned out, some of the teams pushed back on Edward Barrow and said, no, no, because these games affect our position in the standings. We don't want to have her pitch for us. So then they had her do exhibitions, and she would pitch a couple innings of exhibition games for the various minor league teams. But uh, she opened the door in many ways and helped people to see that women could play baseball at a very high level. And the same with Maude Nelson, who's her career spanned, she was a contemporary of Arlington, and her career spanned 40 years in baseball. She started playing on women's teams, then she was given opportunities to play on men's teams, then she and her husband co-owned some barnstorming teams, and eventually she went on to co-own a women's traveling team with another woman. And so she went from player to manager to owner of various uh, women's baseball teams in the late 19th, early 20th century. Now, here's something a lot of people don't know. A um, couple of months ago, I had Gerald C. Wood on my show, and he wrote the definitive biography of Smokey Joe Wood. He was mm-hmm. a blue girl, wasn't he? That's right. He got his start out in Kansas City when a Bloomer Girl team came through there. 
And the uh, back then, uh, just to, again, this is entertainment. The Bloomer Girl teams, not only do they play really good baseball, but they're also having fun and entertaining the crowd. And so periodically you'd have two or three guys uh, be put in dresses and wigs, and they would go out on the, the field with the girls and play on the Bloomer Girl teams. And Smokey Joe Wood was one of the Bloomer Girl players during this time. Rogers, Rogers Hornsby Rogers well. Hornsby was, was another one, absolutely. Now, this is an interesting thing. Why do you think, and, and, and I think the Bloomer Girls evolved, I mean, 40 years the Bloomer Girls lasted, uh, and they played men's towns and semi-pros mm -hmm. and minor league teams. If there was such a backlash in the 1890s against this whole ideology of being a manly man's game, why did they survive as long as they did? Well, I suspect it was uh, just kind of riding the crest of all sorts of entertainment opportunities um, in the early, 19, or early 20th century. Um, I, I believe, and again, I haven't started doing the research yet for my sequel, which will cover 1900 up through 1954. I suspect the teams continued to thrive until the Great Depression when uh, the – People didn't have as much money to spend on, on entertainment and many types of uh, minstrel troops and circuses and other entertainment troops began to fold during the Depression. And I suspect that's probably what happened to the Bloomer Girl teams as well. But I won't know until I really delve into the research for that. Oh, well, that's fantastic. I can't wait to get the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're gonna, it's going to be a while, I suspect, if it was anything like this first one. But the, let me ask you this. A lot of people don't know. The Bloomer Girls, and again, when you get into your research, uh, this is the early 20th century, they played night games before even Major League Baseball did. Yes, yes. I have run across that periodically. They were some of the I think it was the Boston Bloomer Girls played some of the first night baseball, and I think they actually traveled with the, uh, the lights. Um, and I'm thinking it's... Uh, was it Needham's Bloomer? There were two Boston Bloomer Girl teams. That's one of the, the other things that's really confusing when you're doing research. You have a group run by this guy named uh, Wal uh, Galbraith, and then you have another one by a W.P. Needham, and they're playing at the same time. So, oh, and then you get a bunch of other teams that call themselves the Boston Bloomer Girls, trying to capitalize on the popularity of the Boston Bloomer Girls. So, it, it can be a nightmare trying to sort fact from fiction, but you begin to see Boston Bloomer Girl teams advertising themselves as the only and original Boston Bloomer Girl teams because they're trying to fight back against some of these fake teams that are playing and giving them a bad name because they play so bad. And let me ask you this question. I know, and I, by reading about how you put this book together, there was a lot of challenges, and one of them is, again, you're going back to the 1800s, you don't have any live witnesses, somebody to talk to, uh, you don't have a voice um, from it, but some of the sources were lacking, obviously, because nothing was ever recorded. Yep, that is absolutely the case, uh, particularly, as I mentioned, for black women players, we don't have a lot of resources. The best resources I found were at the women's colleges because many of those colleges maintain excellent archives, and I was able to go in and read letters from the players in which sometimes, like, that was the, the real – it's like a treasure hunt. And when I went to Vassar, it was wonderful to I, – I happened to cross a roster of players from 1868, and I was able to go into the player – archives and I ran across a couple letters from players who mentioned playing baseball in letters that they wrote home and so that was quite exciting and periodically you run across things like that uh, diary entries that mention baseball uh, the photographs that was another key that I didn't really emphasize as much in the book but it struck me later if you look at the illustrations of the 19th century players that appeared in newspapers, and then you compare that to actual photographs of the players, such as the one that's on the cover of my book, there's no comparison. The, the imagery that tries to portray these women as sexualized and unfeminine, 
uh, it's, it's just false. It's a false narrative. And you look at how the players actually dressed. Many of them did wear long skirts, corsets. Uh, they had their hair carefully uh, done up. Even while they were playing baseball, they wanted to remain feminine. So those photographs are a real treasure. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no, there is no question that anyone interested in not only baseball history but women's history has to dive into this book. And like we mentioned before the show, somebody said that it was boring. We just spent an hour talking about it. Were you bored? <laughs> <laughs> you know, were you bored? No. But um, – the reviews have been very positive uh, on your book. I loved your book. Let me ask you this question. Um, with all the research you've done and everything that, you know, every ounce of sweat that you put into this book, what are the, some of the things that you didn't know um, before you, um, you know, took the journey? Because when you do a book like this, and I know because I'm doing some research for a book that I'm going to be planning to uh, publish with Gerald C. Wood on the Trish Speaker Ty Cobb affair, which I don't think there was ever a book written about, you always are on a journey somewhere, but you don't know what. What are some of the things you're going to take um, away from this uh, that you've learned that you'll never forget? Well, mostly I just learned how false the narrative about 19th century girls and women had been. I bought into the narrative that women were frail, women were weak, women stayed home, and it's just a false narrative. From the very earliest research uh, or the era that I did, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, you find examples of girls out doing horseback riding and swimming and boating and just all sorts of activities. And they they didn't want to just stay at the home. In many cases, they were forced into that role, but they were much more active than what I had believed prior to researching this book. And, of course, the biggest surprise was simply that baseball had not always been considered a man's game, that it was a gender-neutral pastime right on up through till the end uh, after the Civil War. I would probably mark the 1880s as the watershed when the the narrative that baseball is a man's game really starts to get some traction. So that was my biggest surprise, that baseball really truly was a national pastime for girls and boys, men and women. And, you know, some it, it's a very important, it's a very important subject because back in college in the late 80s, early 90s, I, mean, I took a, a class on the history of England, uh, and it was taught by a professor who uh, marched in, in the civil rights uh, movement of the 60s and the whole me decade of the 70s and fought for uh, the whole uh, women's amendment. And uh, she was uh, teaching a class. Her name was Professor Anderson. But the whole Victorian image and of course Victoria was queen for about 63 years I believe from 1838 to 1901 this whole idea that even sexual attitudes changed in England they said uh, before their wedding nights the, the women would ask their mothers what do you do uh, on your wedding night? And, and then they yep. would say lie back and think of England what the <laughs> hell is that right can you I mean, can you imagine <laughs> Have you ever heard that? I mean, that's crazy. Yes, you know, I have. Back, yes, I have. Lie back and think of England. Now, um, you get that conservative nature, and, I, and again, crossed with the manly man, and this is a women. Women got to do A, B, C. Men got to do uh, D, E, and F. Uh, baseball really uh, threw, a baseball, threw a baseball right through the window or the mirror shattering that image. Absolutely, absolutely. And hopefully we can – it does appear we're starting to turn the tide a little bit, and it is becoming more acceptable for girls to sign up for Little League baseball teams instead of Little League softball teams. And there are girls' teams and leagues being organized all over the country now. I'm very excited about that. So who knows? Maybe the iceberg is finally starting to, to move down the fjord, and we, we can finally – restore baseball to its gender-neutral past. And the thing is, people got to realize this right now, that it began as a gender-neutral sport, 
It's been convoluted all through the years. So anyone who says, don't play baseball, play softball, don't know their history. And they got to go pick up this book. <laughs> That's what I have to tell them. That's right. That's right. Where can we find your book besides Amazon and any other online store? Can you find it in the um, in the great archives, if there are any now, any bookstores? <laughs> I believe I was told that uh, Barnes & Noble is carrying it in store. Uh, the publisher is working with uh, Books A Million. You can get it on their website, but they're also working on placing it in the store. Uh, Target, I've heard has it available online and of course you can get it from the university of illinois press's web page awesome i hope you had a good time today i had a, I had a blast i did thank you so much for having me on i really enjoyed it and you know just hold the line a second i'm going to tell you two final things number one isla borders is going to be on my show next week we're going to talk about wonderful Excellent book, Making My Pitch. I just read it a few weeks ago, superb book with Gene Ardell. Yeah, and I'm finishing it up now. And uh, Dr. Cat Williams just sent me her book on what happened after uh, the Women's League ended in 1954. I have her coming up. And, of course, I I had uh, Dr. Leslie Heffy, and uh, she did uh, the book, uh, The Encyclopedia of Women in Baseball, which, again, I tell people to pick this up. And especially men, because you have to learn. That's women right. Are very, very important to this game. Hang the line. This is how I end the show, and then I'll talk to you after I end the show. Folks, me, you, everyone listening to the show just got a complete overview of what most of us folks don't know. Women and baseball are synonymous right from the inception. Go pick up the Bloomer Girls. It's a fantastic read. It's eye-popping because anything that is hearsay or that has been uh, been sexist over the years just doesn't fly when you get the evidence and you get a beautiful treatise like the Bloomer Girls uh, by Professor Deborah A. Shattuck. As always, I'm Ian Kahanowitz. Thank you so much, Professor Shattuck, for being on the show. And in the immortal words of Edward R. Murrow, Good night, folks. Good luck. We'll see you next time.